Okay, hey everyone, welcome to another episode of On The Wrist from Off The Cuff. Today we have a really new and exciting review for you from the brand Seiko. Now I know if you're a fan of the channel, you've seen tons of Seikos featured here, but rarely ever anything quartz and definitely nothing from the high-end Astron line. So a little bit about Seiko as a brand. They were founded back in 1881. They are Japanese in origin, but now have factories throughout Asia. They cover all market segments from entry level to high end. This would be somewhere in the middle, but definitely leaning more towards the high end. Uh, in terms of the type of watch, I'd consider this an everyday adventure watch, some key common characteristics and design language when you're looking for something that you can take with you on that everyday adventure. You're going to want something that's sporty, legible, and tough. And this has it all, guys. This is the Seiko Astro. Astron SB XD007. That's the JDM nomenclature, or if you buy this internationally, this will be the SSJ007. Now, um, modern Astron is mostly known for being the world's first GPS solar watch. And by connecting to the GPS network, the Astron adjusts at the touch of a button um, to your time zone. And by taking all of its energy that it needs from light alone, it never needs a battery change, which is very appealing to me. I've always been a big fan of Seiko's high, accurate, uh, high accuracy quartz movements, but I'm not a fan of the idea of having to have the battery swapped out at any time. So this really negates all of that, which was great. And specifically within this SSJ line, they stripped down the typically more cluttered display and subdial heavy modern Astron aesthetic and really packed it all into a more minimal and compact layout. And while the 007 isn't quite the most stripped down, it still retains the full Astron character with complex angular facets uh, highlighted by a finely textured dial and a multi finished ceramic bezel. Uh, so, oh yeah, and also it's full titanium with Seiko super hard coating, and that's not even all of it. Uh, it also has a toolless um, micro adjusting clasp, which is great. I, oh, and also, I this isn't even part of the notes, but it, it also has 200 meters of water resistance uh, without a screw down crown. So that's how tight the tolerances are on this piece to give you an idea of just the level of uh, this watch. It's really not meant to be a cheap quartz alternative to a mechanical. This is really taking, um, you know, quartz timekeeping to a whole new stratosphere. And the price is pretty up there too. So the MSRP from Seiko is $29.50 or about 200,000 and so yen, uh, Japanese yen anyway, which comes out to about 1460 USD, um, which is, I purchased this from sakurawatches.com. Definitely check them out. Um, I've had nothing but good experiences with them and I bought quite a few pieces for the channel through them. So I'll leave a link down in uh, the description. But with all that said, that was quite a bit of an intro, but I'm sure you've enjoyed watching this tick and probably trying to call out any type of misalignment uh, on the dial or the chapter ring or the hands. So uh, with all that, let's zoom the camera out, get this piece in hand and take a closer look. Okay, let's check this thing out. So the first thing I'll say is because of the design, the visual weight makes this look like a larger watch, but I will say in the metal, it's actually much smaller and much more compact. Just to give you guys an example, uh, this is a 39 millimeter watch, and so is the Seiko Alpinist, and they wear very similarly. Check that out, guys, uh, that side by side. Um, and, you know, they actually have a lot of the same attributes as well, considering the 200 meters of water resistance and just the absolute versatility in a very compact size. So when I saw the more squared off case, I thought that it was going to render um, a lot larger. But I will say the proportions of these beautiful, just, oh man, the, uh, the indices on here are just next level i mean definitely comparative to something you'd see from grand seiko and i will say that a lot of what you're going to see here is very comparative to grand seiko but definitely with a more sporty uh, undertone so you can see here guys nobody really complains about the alpinist wearing too large and uh i don't think anybody should complain about this astron wearing too large either Another comparable that I have here is actually very similar. It's my Virtual Armor G-Shock, full titanium, also 200 meters of water resistance. Also at a premium price, this is about $1,650 uh, versus the $1,460 here. 
Um, they're very comparable. Uh, they also do receive uh, updates for exact timekeeping, uh, which is great. And then, you know, those the full, of course, this has more of a legacy design. It's very iconic. Um, I, I really do love this G-Shock, but it's one of the reasons that honestly gave me, uh, <clears throat> I think, more interest in even checking out a high accuracy, you know, or GPS updated quartz watch because this has just been so wearable and it's been my grab and go piece. It's just, it's always ready. The time's always running. I have so many other watches, honestly, um, before I wear any watch, I pretty much have to set it that morning, um, unless that I, you know, I've worn it recently, but, uh, typically the rotation's pretty heavy, but this watch is always ready. My G-Shock is always ready. And now my Astron is always ready. And you can see the square shape that this is a bit wider, um, but thanks to the full titanium construction, it wears really well. Not overly heavy, not overly light. It just has the right amount of heft. And I feel very similar about the Astron in terms of the way it feels in hand and on wrist. But I did want to kind of share that with you and also let everybody geek out about the synchronization. Yeah, that's 100% accuracy on the timekeeping there. Uh, you can see the seconds just, you know, going uh, absolutely perfectly there. So wonderful. Now to get into some more of the details of this particular piece, um, 39 millimeter diameter, 12 and a half millimeters thick, 46 millimeters lug to lug, which is about perfect for a 39 millimeter watch. It's full titanium with Seiko super hard coating. Um, it does have a beautiful flat sapphire crystal with some AR coating as you can kind of catch as I get some flecto right off of the studio lights. Um, <clears throat> And then you're also going to notice this beautiful fixed octagonal ceramic bezel with brushed top surfaces with high polished glossy side facets, which look fantastic guys. It's just an extra touch and uh, just extra bit of flair, extra bit of difficulty. And I think it's really nice that it just matches with that dial in terms of that fine hairline brushing. It just ties in together. And then that kind of brings me to the watch itself and why this one was really, for me, the definitive Astron. Kind of like I mentioned in the intro, I like that it's stripped down, but it still re retains a lot of that uh, Astron design language, you know, um, and the more updated kind of today's Astron going into tomorrow's Astron with all of the angular facets, of course, the Tano uh, or Bear shaped case is something that's been a hallmark of Astron and that whole line for a very long time. Um, moving forward, I love that this was more stripped down, no sub dials, just straight up time and date. And it's just really handsome. And then the black, you know, guys, as much as I love my Grand Seiko GMT with a blue dial, I love that that's the corporate colors and they kind of go together. It's the blue dial, the blue box. The nice thing about this is with the Astron, you're actually getting kind of the corporate uh, matching there for this brushed black finish on the box. So I thought that was really cool. Just so you guys know, if you've never bought an Astron, they do come in these really nice special boxes uh, with a circular cutout. I still got the foam in there for Astron, but this is a really fine piece, great little box. And again, that finish, I love that it kind of ties to that with that graining there. So very, very cool. And uh, I'm sure some of you are wondering what these buttons are for. They're actually to set the watch. And in a more stripped down variation, um, they're actually just like pushers that you'll have to have a tool for. I like that they actually have the built-in triggers because it just makes it that much more user-friendly and intuitive. Also, you're getting um, 200 meters of water resistance and not having a screw down crown which is probably pretty wild to some of you but that just goes to show the level of tolerances that this is built to um, and that really really impresses me and it's not like I'm going to take this diving I have plenty of other watches especially from Seiko that will belong more in the water than this but the fact that it does have 200 meters of water resistance does tell me that it's built to a very, very tight tolerance, and I'll never have to worry. Even if I go overboard, and you know, on a cruise ship or something like that, uh, although I'll be worried about my life, I won't have to worry about my watch, uh, which is really, really nice. 
So in terms of setting, uh, the nice thing is they do come with these little, uh, you know, a couple different editions of the manual. Um, and this is the English one, and it pretty much walks you right through the steps um, to get to give you the gist of it. Uh, essentially, if you set from up here, you hold it three seconds, you're gonna see it tick three seconds, then everything's gonna align to the top. Or you use the bottom and everything will align to the bottom. The main difference is if you use the top trigger, it's gonna be setting your home location location bottom trigger is just going to be updating the time so whenever you get to a new location you can actually uh, still update the time and it not actually go to the to where you're receiving that GPS signal from it'll just be keeping the seconds uh, and you know everything within play and making sure that the timing is still correct versus if you use the upper then when you travel somewhere and you want to set it then it works perfectly that way as well one thing is that uh, for daylight savings you do have to set that manually which also is a great feature for me anyway uh, is because you get a jumping hour check this out so if you just want to move an hour back or forth so if you're traveling you know i'm in california if i want to go to texas it's a very easy setup to just jump the hour and then everything is going to just return right back to where it needs to be perfectly in sync so i love that um so Although you can get the updates and you know there is a certain level of automation there, I like the manual feedback um, and the way that it's integrated is very, very intuitive. Again, for such a complex watch, um, it's really just a small little handy uh, notebook that I really needed to kind of figure this out and I figured it out really well. Uh, in terms of receiving the signal, um, it'll tell you and you can also even put it in an airplane mode as you can see won't get into that too much because this is I'm sure will already be a long video just from me rambling and gushing about how much I love this watch um, because it's getting a GPS signal which is typically you know it's it's from outdoors uh, from a satellite what is going to happen is you're typically going to need to be outdoors when you're pushing these buttons if you want to receive or standing next to a window or your back sliding glass door um, so that's one thing to consider. And then also, if you're during daylight savings, then you have to manually roll the hour um, back or forward, depending if it's spring forward or, or fall back. So soon, I won't have to worry about that because daylight savings will be over. But in the meantime, whenever I do zero this back in, it when it updates, it'll end up going to the previous hour um you know and then i have to manually update so that's one thing but it ends up being an awesome honestly like an awesome feature because you can actually just skip around and very easily adjust your time if you're traveling which i really really like so a lot there <laughs> um, so yeah again push pull crown unsigned that's going to be upsetting for some people but you know what this is a very sporty watch not too worried about signed crowns there the movement although you can't see it is uh the seiko gps solar caliber 3x22 this has 100 percent accuracy um you know as long as it's getting those gps updates and if you're not getting the updates it'll basically be widest tolerance is going to be plus or minus 15 seconds per month without a signal so far from as long as I've had it, um, I've got it to be variant, not quite uh, plus one seconds after a couple of weeks. So, you know, I would say for the month, it's probably going to be two, three seconds max for this particular unit. Um, so again, those are the widest tolerances. I know a lot of people, they see wide tolerances and they just, you know, get really upset and, and don't really think about the fact that that covers a lot more um you know there, there's room there and, and typically you're going to either get the top or the bottom or somewhere in the middle um you know so there's there's a lot of different options there but yeah i just i love this watch it, it just uh it's so different than what i have in the rest of my collection and it just serves again as that grab and go piece that has so many things that i really appreciate about mechanical watches um, built in here i know a lot of kind of what i have typically is going to be if it's quartz it's going to be meant to be cheap meant to be knock around this is really meant to be high end it's, it has a lot of those values and um you know that ethos of just high end 
look at that in terms of the craftsmanship. They they care. This is not meant to be a budget version of a mechanical watch by any means. This is meant to be the pinnacle of uh, you know of a quartz watch. Uh, so I really really like that and the whole uh, application of just the theme in general. So getting into the details on this gorgeous dial here, guys. Applied indices with loom dots on that outer chapter ring. You're getting textured vertical grain black dial uh, framed date at the three o'clock with the color match disc, which is great. I think it integrates really well. I like seeing white numerals matching the white font um, over a black background, right? So everything flows really beautifully. You're getting dual finished hour and minute hands with a painted seconds hand. And uh, of course, you're also getting it loomed. You can see the beautiful finishing there. So you're gonna get contrast because you're getting half brushed, half high polish, which means uh, depending on the lighting situation, you're still gonna be good to go in terms of getting um, ultimate legibility, which is great, especially with an analog watch. It's using Seiko's Lumabrite, but this is not a dive watch by any means. So this is not, you know, you can see loom plops. It definitely, I'd say, is loomed more similar uh, to an Alpinist, which is meant to be just more so of an everyday adventure watch versus a deep diver or some, you know, cave dwelling type of watch. So it's not really uh, putting too much emphasis on, you know, uh, pit, uh, legibility in pitch black environments. So, uh, but you are getting Luma right, so it's well applied and well done. It's just, you know, smaller surface area in general, apart from the hands. Now, um, now let's get to some of the special stuff. Check this out. Just a bonus of having this is you actually get this great toolless micro adjust clasp. And the way that it works is you just just push these triggers and there you go you basically get a half link worth of uh, ratchet there just two clicks but I tell you what it comes in handy so whether it's just dialing it in in terms of getting the perfect sizing or being able to close it all the way like I wear it and then hey if it gets hot something like that wrist expands then all of a sudden I do have a little bit of more breathing space. And you know, with this being titanium um, and really well articulated, I will say that I do wear this a little bit tighter so it's nice to be able to loosen it up. Um, so yeah, this is already just rambling on and on. 21 millimeter lugs, you're getting all solid and faceted three link style bracelet tapering down to 18 millimeters and then that toolless micro adjust clasp which is amazing so really loving that let's go ahead and get this piece on wrist and see how it wears okay guys as you can see on my seven and a quarter to seven and a half inch wrist this wears really well not overpowering by any means and uh, it's I just love it. Of course, if I was to get really up close to the lens there, you're gonna get some lens distortion. It's gonna appear a little bit bigger, but even then, still nice and centered. So what I'll do is I'll just bring it in a little bit tighter while we have some space here so you can get a better look without getting the distortion to go with it. So you can see really well centered on the wrist, not oversized, not undersized. I'd say just the right size. Lays really beautifully. Uh, even though it is quite angular, it does still have ergonomics in mind, like most Seikos, guys. Beautiful undercuts, beautiful beveling, very nice, all the way through to that bracelet. It's just immaculate, and I love it, honestly. It is just, I love that it's always ready to go. Um, again, as much as I love uh, you know mechanical watches and you know, I do enjoy setting them uh, Before wearing them it is nice to be able to just grab and go and have something you can run and gun with and it's just always ready uh, For any time that you need it. So with that we'll go ahead and roll it back out We'll set up for some loom shots low light transition and closing thoughts Okay, we'll go ahead and hit the lights here so as you can see um, still nice, obviously not a loom beast at all, and it's not meant to be. And what you're gonna see here once I work in some low light transition is that it doesn't necessarily need it because these indices really pick up light. Check that out. Not even directly on there, just reflecting off of 
a dark room. Look at those indices, they're insane. Just the level of fastening, the size, it's just pretty amazing. And then whether it's the full flat face or just, uh, you know, little glints and sparkles coming off of the facets, it just works. So one thing I really do enjoy about the low light transition is you're not always gonna be out in the middle of a field enjoying direct sunlight. A lot of times you're gonna be coming in and out of buildings, walking underneath overhangs, maybe underneath the shade of a tree or just spending time in your favorite automobile. So it's nice to see what these colors finishes and textures render like in less than optimal lighting to even include some harsh lighting like you're going to see here which typically would expose any type of production defects but all you're going to see is just the light very uniformly gliding over that nice hairline brushing and whether it's on the ceramic dial that beautiful vertical grain on the dial texture itself. I'm sorry, did I say ceramic dial? Ceramic bezel. Um, and then, of course, the links on that gorgeous bracelet that has a fantastic taper from 21 millimeters down to 18. So really nice and refined. And you guys can see the way that the light plays. I mean, I love how matted this thing just captures the light. Um, right there on the vertical grain. Very, very cool. But uh, yeah, this thing's awesome, guys. I, I really like it. And at this angle, you can't really take advantage of how beautiful that grain texture is. So I'm just gonna turn it a little bit so you guys can get that little view in here um, with these closing thoughts. So on the wrist, it wears a lot smaller than the press photos would suggest. The shape does read large without the context of your wrist, but when you get it um, on and it just, it feels more like an Alpinist than a G-Shock, I will say, in terms of the wear profile. Um, so that's a surprise. And then in terms of model variants, it's also available in a blacked out version uh, with a grainy textured dial. So not quite this dial, um, but you know, still another handsome option with a textured dial, which is not always easy to find when it comes to something that's solar powered because then you kind of have to work out how that's all going to shine through the dial and be able to still pick up light and absorb power. Um, so in terms of comparable models, you can find similarly themed pieces um, within the Casio Oceanus line. Um, and typically their more stripped down models are going to be much, much cheaper. Um, so if you're looking for a three-hander with a date versus some of the more advanced Oceanus watches that are gonna have all the subdials similar to some of the more, um, I, I guess, busier Astron models. So there's that. Um, I personally prefer the Seiko's build quality and design aesthetic. Um, I just feel like it's more original and it doesn't feel like, again, like an alternative to a mechanical watch. It This, for me, feels like its own thing. Um, and then you can compare it to Citizen's Echo Drive models as well, um, where you'll find maybe similarly themed pieces more um, I'd say on the outer uh, flank, um, either being uh, less refined and more rugged tool watches that are going to be a lot cheaper or more so dedicated dress watches that are going to look like Grand Seiko's essentially, which just happen to have solar power and they're going to be a lot more expensive. So uh, for citizen comparables, they're going to be on the outer reaches. And then, of course, uh, in terms of GPS or any type of radio signal update, uh, you know, different technologies, but they're available there. But typically it's just going to be a different type. Uh, it won't be necessarily a direct comparable. Closest direct comparable, I say, would be the Oceanus line, um, which I do prefer the Astron to that. Um, if I'm gonna have a premium Casio, I prefer it to be a G-Shock. Um, but it's, you know, it's never too late. Uh, you know, uh, so I, I could always add an Oceanus eventually if the right model uh, comes out with the right spec. But I mean, for me right now, this is kind of the best offering for an analog, um, you know, kind of super watch in terms of everything that it offers with the, you know, the materials, the finishing, the, you know, the, the capabilities that it has in terms of the accuracy, the watch resistance, the ease of use 
with that uh, toolless uh, micro adjust clasp. So really, really great um, from you know all directions. So for me, guys, bottom line, this is one of the best overall spec modern Seikos available. Um, and I don't really have to add much context to that. It's just straight up one of the best. Um, it's a watch that can keep time. Um, and, you know, it's the perfect kind of transitional piece for any collectors who mainly focus on mechanicals that are looking for something different. You know, that's kind of how I felt about it. Um, and it's still executed to the premium levels they would expect from a $3,000 watch. Like this, again, it's not a cheap quartz alternative to a premium mechanical watch. This is, um, you know, it's really executing as a, a modern and just ultimately capable timepiece. And it just happens to be using quartz, um, but it also is happening to use one of the best quartz around and some of the best technology in terms of uh, keeping that accuracy just always dialed in. So with all that said, I know this was a long one. Uh, if you liked the video, please do it like. And if you haven't already, please subscribe for more content just like this. Thanks guys.